Okay, welcome to the second half of the day. We'll have about four or five halves today, <laughs> but this is only the second one. <laughs> We're going to talk about gaps. What is a gap? Eh? Uh, actually, Tom has told us a lot about gaps, uh, either in this morning's talk and in yesterday's talk. So I'm going to uh, probably repeat some things that, we, that we've already said and we revisit some themes and we might deviate in, in some of the respects. <coughs> I will give you first an overview of what gaps are in general, what gap analysis is, we'll come to the end too, and then we'll get into a very specific set of gaps, the, the gaps that are more related to uh, the PBR, the primary biodiversity records. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, start by saying that a gap has basically two different components. Um, thank you. A gap is basically a lack of knowledge. We lack knowledge about something because we haven't collected data. They are not there and or we have the data but we don't know how to interpret them. So the gap in this case is that we don't have the necessary knowledge about something. But there is a second specific gap which is normally part of the first gap, part of the knowledge gap, which is the data gap. Because we might know what the data mean, but we know that those data are not enough for a good interpretation. <coughs> so a data gap means that we know where we want to go, we know what we want to have, but we don't have it. We lack data. Okay, so normally a data gap, data gap, data gaps lead to uh, knowledge gaps as well. So uh, we, we, what we are concerned with mostly is knowledge gap, but sometimes we have to solve the data gaps first, right? So <coughs> let's go specifically to the biodiversity knowledge gaps. So we know that biodiversity exists. There is a reality, which is the variety of life out there. And the knowledge about biodiversity has to be gained. Biodiversity is, biodiversity is there, it's like understanding the universe. The universe was there, but until recently, or a few centuries ago, we thought that the universe were a set of closed spheres in which uh, lights were moving around. <coughs> so we need to gain knowledge about biodiversity. So, there will always be a gap between what we know, what we have gained in terms of knowledge, and what we should or could eventually know. We can describe this in, in this plot here, when we have a zero, a zero knowledge, when we, have, when we know nothing, and the absolute knowledge, godlike knowledge, which will never be achievable, and some kind of knowledge which eventually can be achieved. Mm, this is not showing the entire thing. I don't know why. This is cropping the right part of, of the... Well, but doesn't matter much. I don't think I have many things there. Don't worry. So, what else? We might then understand that there will, be, there will always be absolute gaps that will remain between the absolute knowledge and the knowledge that eventually could be achieved. But there will be also relative gaps that will remain between achievable knowledge and functional knowledge, which is the knowledge that we need to answer something. Hmm? And then there will be also uh, practical gaps. The practical gaps go between the functional knowledge and the gain knowledge. This is the knowledge we do have, this is the knowledge that, that we need to answer some question, and this is the knowledge that we, that we could eventually get at. Hmm? So we're basically dealing with this kind of gaps here between what we know and we want to know. What we want to know, because we, what we want to do is to fill this gap. To fill the gap that will uh, allow us to answer something. All right? <coughs> this is what we'll deal, we're trying to deal with. Filling this particular gap. Practical gap. Okay. So we know that gap exists and we, mm, we need to detect those gaps. We need to be able to tell where a gap is. Um, as 
we saw before, knowledge comes from data. So, perhaps some, somebody went to the field and collected data and made lists, and then when? And then what? This knowledge, by which I mean the list of species of a site, for instance, might or might not be known. It might happen that we can gain knowledge from this somebody else's knowledge, or the user might not know that. Both things can happen. Why should we ignore this data? Because perhaps the data were not made available. As Tom showed us yesterday, the data could be sitting in a cabinet, which is closed by key, and somebody has thrown out the key, and we can't get hold of that, or the ledger have been thrown to the garbage can during our uh, or a remodelation of the building, or whatever. Some data could have been published, but this, this doesn't guarantee that the data can be reached, because at times, publication don't reach the user. There was a time, uh, actually I think there is still a time when a taxonomical paper to be valid has to be deposit deposited in, if I remember correctly, 20 institutions, uh, 20 libraries. If you don't happen to have access to one of those libraries, you won't have access to basic taxonomical knowledge. And that was true until recently when the advent of electronic publication made it basically possible for anyone to get anything that has been published in recent times. But still, a lot of knowledge is locked there. I don't think that Google will actually scan all those taxonomical papers of which only 20 copies exist, perhaps one in a, beach, in a large library, and the 19 remaining copies have been thrown away during a, how do you say, expurgo, well, during a, a cleanup, eh? during a purge of, of the library. All right. <clears throat> so, when do we know that there's a gap? We will know that there's a gap when we are certain that data were never collected. There's a clear gap. If we don't have data about some region because we know that nobody went ever there, we know there's a gap. <coughs> Until Hillary went up to, to the Mount Everest, nobody had gone there, except perhaps for Mallory, because we, but, but we'll never know whether Mallory actually climbed up the Everest. And I doubt, I doubt they saw any bug there, or they had time to look for any bug there, but still, there are places where we haven't ever gone. We know that data were collected, but it's no lost. We can know that data have been lost sometime. We know that data were collected, but haven't located this data yet. We know that somebody did in some place, like an expedition, so there must be a ledger somewhere, but we simply can't find it. That's the data gap. Or we know that data were collected, but we know that these data were not enough or not good for the particular purpose we want to achieve. Hmm? That's the most common, or those two probably are the most common gaps. There are data out there, but they aren't enough. So we, not, we need to sample more or get more data out of it. On top of it, we might refer to a very interesting concept, very recently explained, which is Digital Accessible Knowledge, or DAC for short. Hmm? Now, okay, it's coping <coughs> both sides. <coughs> a Digital Accessible Knowledge uh, regarding biodiversity is defined by as the primar primary data that are both digital and accessible in standard formats, right? <coughs> this concept appears in this paper that you have actually over there, I think, this is one. <coughs> and uh, it's a really important concept because it basically sets the arena for getting the data or for which data could we get. If data are digital, they are far more easily reachable than if data are in analog forms. So this digital accessible knowledge or DAC. Do you pronounce it DAC or? DAC, I don't know. Yeah, you have to set the rules for that. 
<laughs> okay, this deck is the opposite to what Brian Haydor called dark data. Dark data, which are data that have been basically lost and cannot be recovered. But there are lots of data which are somewhere in between, somewhere between dark and dark. We can call them gray data. And they might actually conform the majority of the data that are available. So data can be lost if they don't become DAC. A way to ensure that gaps can be filled is to ensure that gray data become DAC, become known digital data. We can't possibly do anything about dark data. They have been lost. But gray data, which might be in isolated media, or obsolete media, all disks, for instance, may eventually, with some effort, get into a digital form that now can be accessed. And if data in analog form but can be digitized, they will become digital. All this thing takes time and effort, naturally, and quite a lot of it. Yeah? Infrastructures or standards might help moving data from gray into digital, but it will be basically a matter of having the right documentation. If documentation about gray data don't exist, doesn't exist, it's quite difficult to digitize them. Documentation metadata about data means that if I get a ledger that has three columns there with some data on them, either I know what the data mean because it's documented or I can't use the data. Okay, I might, I might suppose, as in the movie, which movie? Uh, what's the name of that movie? Close Encounters in the of the Third King. Do you remember? Yes. Kind, thank you. Close encounter Encounters of the Third Kind. That the French translator was the one that said, ah, okay, those series of numbers were coordinates because none of them was beyond 108 in one of the blocks and no one, none of them started by being more than 90, and the rest two blocks were less than 60 each, and so forth. Okay, so we can possibly deduct what a column means or what a bit of data, of analog data, mean, but the only way to be, to be sure is that the data has been properly documented. Then there are services that will take care of this digitization of the data, or there is effort put by, pers by people, personal effort, uh, digitization <coughs> projects that might help moving things from analog to digital. But basically what we want, what we want to be is here. We would like to have everything into this block here, digital and accessible. It might be digital, but behind a payware or a paywall, then it's only accessible to some. Or just behind the password. Or behind a <coughs> <coughs> you, you. password. <coughs> okay, we need the data to fill gaps. We might we might need to get new data, or we might try to locate data that help us fill in the, the gaps. And some of this gap filling might be easy. Some of this gap filling might be difficult. Uh, <coughs> those are examples of places where accessible data may be, may be existing in analog form, forms in which data may be existing in digital form, but some of them are easy to get or to come by, such as databases tend to be quite easy to, to mine uh, for, for the data we need. And if the files are not well structured or need some kind of processing, then it might be slightly harder to get the data, but eventually we might. However, if the data are digital are in and are locked, then we might be out of luck. We might need to pay a lot or to convince somebody to release a password, as, <coughs> as Tom pointed out. So that's, that might be much harder. Analog uh, things can be also harder to come by, especially lost data. What about the future? In the future, data will probably be always digital, but not necessarily always. And the future opens opportunity and avenues to get data for gap filling by new techniques uh, or new procedures, such as 
uh, the development of automated surveys and monitoring. When Tom was explained to in the morning that he might spend one day trying to learn how a particular warbler sings, and I was thinking, okay, yes, and what Tom will probably develop in the future is a kind of automatic voice recognition system in his laptop or in even better, in his mobile phone, that will work very much like Shazam or like a Soundhound, that you point there and they, it will say, okay, this is this 